Okay, y'all, y'all are going to have to kind of work with me a little bit here. This is my first time kind of doing the whole thing myself, so it may be a little bumpy, but uh, we hopefully we'll get through it. We have several new faces here today, and so I want to welcome you all for coming in. Um, also, a, a warm welcome to all the old familiar faces. Oh, I shouldn't have said old. <laughs> All the familiar faces instead of that thing. Okay, um, let's see. Today we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about reincarnation and the cycle of nature. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit different than what we normally do, uh, but hopefully just want to give you guys some information about that. Um, first, I need to make an announcement. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. If you're on call, we will understand if you need to set yours to silent, but no one wants to be that guy, and no one wants to sit next to that guy either. So please take a moment to turn those phones off now, which is a nice reminder to me to turn my phones <laughs> off. Because nobody ever calls me, but today I'll get a bunch of calls. So we'll take care of that. Okay. Also, please remember that we are filming and we are streaming this, so if you come up to talk or anything, that you will be recorded. Okay. If you're in witness protection, you know, it might not be a good idea to do that. Okay. We've all seen that on TV. Okay. Uh, I have not been informed of any other announcements that need to be made here other than, other than, oh, go ahead, Cynthia, come on. Next, next uh, Sunday, after service at noon, we have been talking about starting a CUPS group here, which is the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans. And so we're going to have our first kind of formal, informal meeting to kind of get that set up and talk about. So if you are interested in that, uh, we'll be here next Sunday at noon. Okay? Ma'am. We also got some, uh, some here. On behalf of the garden, we got some plants from Jackson's. And I went a little overboard on the peppers and eggplant. So if you need a pepper or eggplant, um, see me after the service. Uh, and also, <clears throat> if you have anything for the newsletter, <laughs> please get it in to me within a few days. Okay? Thanks. I think that was directly pointed at me also because I'm horrible at doing that, so my apologies there. Um, I, she, that reminded me too, um, I am Dr. Robin Hansen. Uh, I do a myriad of different things around the country in here, so that's who I am, and I should have started with an introduction for myself. Uh, we are going to have the chalice lighting now, please. We're, When I say, when I light this, uh, or light this, may this light provide. Okay, sorry, hello. Uh, this chalice lighting reminded me of Genesis, so I asked Robin, uh, where did this come from? And she said, she made it up. So um, it does sort of link off of uh, Genesis, but I like it better. And I think uh, Estella, uh, if you listen to it, I think you'll really like this one as well. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. The body returns from whence it came, as does the soul. Yet our faith in all there is binds us together, body to soul, brain to mind, and past to future. May this flame provide light and warmth throughout our journey.
it. It is still an electric battery operated candle. I have a question, and you don't have to answer if you want. Just answer if you feel like answering. I see, Stella. Very cool. If you could be anything in this whole wide universe, what would you be? Ooh, that sounds fun. Does anybody have an idea what they might be if they could choose any animal or plant or anything? Oh, yes. A fish. Ooh, that sounds fun. Anybody else? Oh, yes. A cat. And you'll be a cat too? Okay. Anybody else? Stella. A mountain lion, a big cat. Very cool. An oak tree. I like that. Did you say a cat in a cat bus? I have something to show you after Ari. Remind me. OK. <laughs> OK. The, the story for all ages today is not an actual story. It's a poem that I wrote called The Law <clears throat> the law of the conservation of energy. No, this was not AI written. We looked at maybe creating one with AI, but it just came up with some weird things that did not work. So I decided to just use my I in my brain, my intelligence. So I wrote this, and it's interesting. It's a work in project, though, pro uh, progress. Okay. If you could be anything, what would you be? Would you fly like a seagull out over the sea? Addy. Addy. Look up here. Would you forage in the forests as a big fluffy bear? Would you lounge as a cat? without giving a care. You could play as a dolphin under the warm, sparkling sun, diving deep into water for food or for fun. Nope, it was jumping and swimming. Or maybe a turtle, a spider, a penguin, a moose. Or maybe a gosling from Big Mama Goose. A fluttering butterfly or a new baby star. If you could be anything on Earth or from far, what would your energy transform you to be in this beautiful, sparkling, vast cosmic sea? The law of the conservation of energy has been proved. Energy can't be destroyed, it just gets moved. Like a teacup of energy, where will the tea go? Yes, the teacup. If you spill it or pour it, it's still, she does. Well, if you spill or, or pour it, it's still energy tea, you know. We are all filled with energy and dust from the stars. Um, we are all filled with potential to take us real far. We are all possibilities. We are all imagination. We are all energy in the law of conservation. So, if you could be anything, what would you be in this beautiful, sparkling, vast cosmic sea? Something to think about. Okay, friends. Let's head out to R.E. Tondi, would you carry the lantern? Thank you very much.
Hello, there I am. We're going to have the offering now, so if my ushers could jump up and... Thank you so much. And we will have just a little bit of a musical interlude here. Additional announcements anybody might have? Anything going on? It is Pride Weekend here in St. Uh, St. Louis. Where am I? <laughs> I'm in Topeka. <laughs> With a long night last night. Uh, and so uh, there's been a lot going on with uh, some attacks against uh, people um, on, you know, in the gay and lesbian and trans community, not here specifically, but throughout the country, um, things are really kind of starting to heat up. So please be aware, if you are an ally, please be aware. And uh, if you hear things, if you see things, please, please be an advocate, okay? Um, any, anything else? Y'all are being particularly quiet today. No joys, no concerns, no announcements. Right, fine. <laughs> fine, if y'all want to be that way, okay. All right then, I will go on with uh, talking about uh, the subject for today. Uh, we, as I always tell my students, you know, we make it out just a little bit early today. It never, ever happens because I can talk. And normally I'm like, so my, my students are all like, oh, yeah, all right, we're going to get out early today. And normally we're running past time. And they're like, Dr. Hansen. I'm like, I know, I know. Yes, sir? I have an announcement. Got a conference? Yeah, come on up. <laughs> yeah, but at least it's still here. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Bobby and I have a pair of tickets to the barbershop annual uh, program this afternoon, and we can't use them. So if you want them, they're yours, they're paid for. Come and see me or Bobby, thanks. That was very nice. Thank you very much. Hopefully somebody will take advantage of that. Okay, excuse me. So the fourth Sunday of each month, at least until we have our minister on board um, has been given to us who are in the pagan community to um, allow inclusion for, for that, those different paths. And one of the things that's very important to us as pagans is knowledge, is understanding, and is sharing. So, um, Part of what we're going to do on those four Sundays is um, kind of share some of the beliefs, some of the paths that um, we travel, okay? Today, I chose to talk about reincarnation because reincarnation or transmigration and there's all, throughout the world, there's all these different words 
that mean the same thing. Uh, for, for pagans, this is one of, for most pagans, this is one of the most fundamental beliefs in our faith. And that is that that life energy that we all have, that, that energy that animates us and all living things never dies. It, is, it continues forever. And so uh, it, it was fascinating to me that even in faiths that do not believe specifically in reincarnation, in that you will return, your energy will return each time after the physical body uh, passes. That even, even in faiths uh, like Christianity and Islam, that even there, there's still that knowledge, that understanding that, that that energy, that life force continues on. It just doesn't cycle back, okay? So I'm gonna, when I, when I really started delving into reincarnation, not just from a philosophical or religious viewpoint, but from a scientific viewpoint too, it, it, it kind of took me down the rabbit hole because as I started digging into both sides even more, it's like, wow, you know, it's just kind of like mind blowing, especially as you try to bring those two concepts together because normally in our lives, religion and science is always fighting with each other, okay? Because people who are following a faith are like, it's my faith, I don't have to prove it. It's, it's what works for me, it's my faith, it's my belief. But in science, you have to be able to prove your theory. That's, that, those two viewpoints are pretty much diametrically opposed to each other, okay? So there's always been this issue. But I found it fascinating that as I'm looking at reincarnation, transmigration, the return of the soul in these different faiths, that it really kind of merged, not seamlessly, but merged with science and how science looks at, at death. Because science looks at death more as energy, matter and energy. And so just I kind of wanted just to give that foundation before I start talking about what what I found when I was looking at reincarnation and maybe how the two go together. Because honestly, before I kind of started putting this together, I had never thought about <laughs> reincarnation and quantum theory. But uh, now I have a much more merged understanding of the two. So for you are dust, and to dust shall you return. Genesis 3.19. The physical body that each of us inhabits is provided a very short period of existence. The longest recorded lifespan of a human is 122 years. In comparison, the Earth is estimated to be 4.5 billion years old and the universe 13.7 billion years. So this little moment of time for us on this planet is quite minuscule, okay? And so, I, and I think that's something that, that when we start thinking about life and death, why? Why is it so short when where we exist, what we are a part of, goes on for so much longer? As humans, we are familiar with the cycle of life, birth to death. But is that really all there is? Or do we descend to heaven or descend to hell? Or do we rumble through the halls of Valhalla or wander through the peaceful fields of Elysia? Or, as it is for many people, something more than just this one physical life on earth. 
five of the oldest religions known to humanity and still practiced believe that this lifetime is simply a singular example of our existence. Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, Jainism, Christianity, Judaism, all of these faiths still believe that even after physical death, there is something that remains, just in different forms, maybe in different locations. Even the two oldest monotheistic faiths still believe that the soul lives on after physical death. That would be Judaism and Christianity. For the other faiths, it's generally believed that you reincarnate based upon your prior life and the goal is to live well enough to become liberated from the endless cycle of rebirth. We kind of set ourselves up. If the goal is to end that cycle of rebirth, to reach nirvana, if that cycle's endless, you got a problem, okay? But at least you still have something that you're striving for. What is interesting and was fascinating to me when I really dug into this is that regardless of the faith, there is still an essential belief that the soul, the spirit, the life energy that animates living creatures, living things, continues on after the physical body expires. The primary difference between the views held by Christianity and Judaism, where they believe that you go either to heaven or hell, the other four Eastern faiths believe in reincarnation, that our soul will just practice a kind of serial life process where the soul moves on to another physical form after its current physical form expires. You know how today we talk about serial monogamy where you're with just one person for a period of time and then maybe you'll move on to another person. We even have serial marriage now as being common. In reincarnation, it's kind of the same thing because the soul or life energy simply is in one body for a period of time. Then when that body is no longer of use, they just move on to the next one. Okay, so it's kind of a, a serial living, okay? Uh, here, on, our existence here on Earth serves as one of the fundamental existential questions we have as humans. Once we became set in it, one of the first questions that must have been asked is where do we come from? Why are we here? And where do we go when we die? As a, a cultural anthropologist and uh, yeah, somewhat archeologist, I have always been fascinated by what it must have been like in those very early days when humanity became aware and you have, you know, you have life, you have spirit, you have movement, you have, you are, and then all of a sudden they're gone. We know that now the first intentional burials were over 100,000 years ago. And we know that even in that, once life was gone, they would cover the body in, in red. And then they would put the body in a cave or, or they would even bury a body. It was as if they were trying to reanimate because when you're born, you're a little bloody. They're trying to, to recreate that. And, and because they had no concept, no understanding of why this is happening. And they would, they would also make a cycle back very often. We also have found hundreds, well, not hundreds, but thousands of years old 
flower seeds, pollen, in mixed in with those bones. That, that just blew my mind. I'm like, so you're telling me humans who tend to want to change things quickly were putting flowers with dead people tens and 20 and 30,000 years ago? The proverbial question always is, why? Why do we do that? And we still do that today. I, 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 I believe that it must be that we still want to see life even where something it, we know has gone. I, I do a lot of cemetery studies and I, I'm in cemeteries all the time. And so there's, there's beginning to be more and more pictures on the graves because we have better technology for it. But even when I go back and I look at uh, pictures from 100, 120 years ago that are on graves, only once in thousands of photos that are on graves, only once has there ever been the, the photo of a dead person, of somebody who has already passed, but their photo is on their headstone. And that was of an infant. And I, I suspect that was the only picture they had of that infant was after they had passed. And it, it's, this one's well over 100 years old. And so even in death, we want to see life. Reincarnation gives hope, gives a future to us. I still, I, I believe in reincarnation, but I still, I go outside and I feel the sun on my skin or I, I feel the wind against my face and, and the warmth and, and, you know, the beauty of the trees, the birds flying through the air and clouds on a blue sky. I can't even fathom not being able to see that, not being able to know that, to experience that. So I guess for me, that's why reincarnation works. For me, you know, we all have our past. But I can't fathom not being, period, just being. And, and knowing about nature and, and being uh, an admirer of nature, I, I find solace in the fact that I am a part of this nature, that this body comes from the matter, from the earth around us. That my energy, my life energy, my soul, my spirit, whatever it may be, will continue on in some form. I have already decided I'm going to be a thunderstorm, at least for a little while. I love the energy of a thunderstorm. So I want to be part of that energy. And maybe I already am. Maybe that's why a thunderstorm speaks to me. Because the energy that animates me is a part of the energy that crashes and booms and lights the sky. So for, for those of us who follow a path that believes in reincarnation, it answers one of those fundamental questions. Now, although, and I've been talking about it, you know, kind of from a, a faith, a belief background, even though this really is something that we should be dealing with when we talk about religion and faith. It's also distinctly a question of science. And maybe science actually lends some direct evidence for reincarnation. <laughs> when Richie heard that I was going to speak on reincarnation today, she sent me an article entitled, You Want a Physicist to Speak at Your Funeral? It's by Aaron Freeman. So I went in, I was like, oh, cool, yeah, I, I'd like to read that. I'm always up. The more information, the more knowledge I can get, the better. So I went out, the night she sent it to me, I pulled it up, I read it, and I'm like, hmm. So, you know, it takes me down a different path. And the article, obviously, is about science and provides a scientific base for the existence and continuation of our life energy based on the first two laws of thermodynamics. 
Bet you didn't think we were going to be talking about thermodynamics today and talk about reincarnation. But it works and it makes sense. The first law of thermodynamics, energy and matter can be neither created nor destroyed, but only transferred from one form to another. Okay, there we go. Religion, faith, merges well with science at that point. The second law of thermodynamics, energy and matter tend to become dispersed into a more uniform spatial distribution. I read that, I'm like, all right, what does that mean? So here's, here's what it told me. Which means matter and energy are stored, moved, dispersed, and concentrated as part of natural cycles. These are some of the laws of nature, of nature associated right here with our earth. So as I'm looking through this and I saw cycles, I'm like, ah, cycles. And this is part of what is the foundation for reincarnation. It's a cycle, just like life, just like birth and death. And so I started going, okay, let me look at more cycles. Are there more cycles here on earth? And I was fascinated. And I actually learned about some cycles I didn't know about, and they're still coming up with identifying more cycles. That is the wonder, I think, of being sentient, of being human is we're learning, and we're still learning, and there's still so much more to learn. Now, we think we know it all most of the time, but we're still realizing maybe we don't know it all. So here's some of the cycles that I think tie directly into why we have reincarnation, why we have that faith, okay? There are so many cycles that we associate with life beyond what we normally think of. First and foremost, again, we are familiar with the natural cycle of life and death. There's also the rain that falls to earth, that then it evaporates, and then it rains again. And you just have that continuing cycle going on, the water cycle. We have the sun that rises in the east and sets in the west, and it cycles around. And we sure hope that continues to cycle like that. We have the 28-day transition between the new moon, the waxing moon, the full moon, and the waning moon, which amazingly enough, and it's again why the moon is a symbol for women from ancient times, that womanly cycle tends to follow that same 28-day period, okay? Seasonally, we have Summer, transitions into fall, transitions into winter, transitions into spring, and the cycle continues. Less known is how rocks go through a cycle of existence, from crystallization, cooling, weathering, erosion, and metamorphosis. One of the things I learned when I was learning about rocks, you know, I go out and I see a rock, and a rock is hard, and it's just there. If I break a rock open, it just splits into pieces. What I didn't know is that, and again, it's because of our limited interaction, is that when you split a rock open, it's a wound to that rock. That it actually will build a, almost like a scab out of its same material that is softer than the original rock. It will have to harden. I was like, whoa. I'll never look at a rock the same way after that. The earth itself cycles through glacial periods and interglacial periods. Now, they may take thousands of years, but you know, when you're four billion years old, what's 10,000 years or 15,000 years? Carbon dioxide. Taken up by plants, plants are ingested by the animals, and carbon dioxide is once again released. The plants that take up the carbon dioxide and cleanse our air. We always, we hear so much about the trees being uh, cut down in South America, and we are dependent 
upon those trees and plants to clean the air for us. So look at all these cycles that is a part of this earth. Why should we, we who are a part of this earth, both physically, both through our energy, why should we be any different? And I think for some of us along this path, we see that, we see those cycles, and we, we acknowledge and we recognize that we are a part of that cycle too. So why should we just simply end when everything else around us and that's a part of us continues to cycle as well? Have you ever, now, this kind of ties in to and brings us, well, uh, it, it kind of brings us into quantum superposition theory, but it still ties in a little bit to reincarnation. Have you ever experienced deja vu? Now, have you ever felt a, a real pull to some place, some other place on earth, another country, another location, another time period? You know, most, most people say, oh, yeah, I have, you know, or, or you've met that person that you swear you've known him your whole life. Those are the things that make you go, hmm, and you kind of wonder about these things, you know. And, and those are, okay, those are not very scientific, but only because we can't prove. That's, that's, where, we, that's where the rub comes, between science and between faith. And in, when I'm in the classroom, I'm, and my, we're talking about religion, and my students are like, well, but, but what are we supposed to believe in? And uh, which, which faith are you? And stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, when it comes to faith, the thing we have to remember is you don't have to prove anything to anybody. It's faith. It's what works for you. It's what you believe. Now, science, and, and I like science, too. Science, you have to prove it. Okay, so, and, and that's where some of the problem comes in. We can't even prove beyond a shadow of a doubt when death occurs. You know, it used to be when you didn't see a person breathing anymore or you didn't feel a heartbeat. Then as we became more knowledgeable, we now know, oh, nope, they may still be there. We can bring, we may be able to bring them back. Right now, it's when brainwave ends. We haven't figured out a way to bring a person back after that. Who knows down the line we may figure out, oh, we need to do this or we need to do that and we can, we can reinitiate. But we're limited by what we know. When I'm talking about <clears throat> meeting somebody that maybe you feel like you've known before, or you have that instant connection with, or that place you want to go to, or you feel drawn to, or that time period. You know, I want, I, I'm drawn to Turkey. And people are like, what, Turkey? Couldn't you think of something better? You know, like England or, you know, Australia. But you don't get to pick that connection. It's there. Even Wiccans. <laughs> Uh, uh, what we consider today, you know, witches. Forever, for eternity, they will have a service that allows them to say, hey, um, I believe in reincarnation. I'll seek you out the next lifetime. I, I have a friend that um, she's no longer here, but before she passed, we were like, we, we told each other, you know what? I'll find you next time. And you better be looking for me next time, you know. And, you know, when it comes down to it, a lot of this is to help us deal with our own mortality. Because we all, it is the one thing as humans, regardless of where you're born, where you live, what you believe, if you are on the right or if you are on the left, we are born and we are going to die. I'm still trying to figure out how to get, rid, get away from that last one, but I don't think I'm going to. So we have to figure out, we have to find what works for us. And 
that is one thing about you, you, that I embrace and I feel is that you can you can be you here. You may you may not have, be on the same path as somebody else, but you you values that seventh principle that interconnectedness that you be you, and I'm going to value you just for being you, and for realizing. I I commend all of you for having the faith and for having the strength to be who you are. You make the world a better place being who you are. So in the end, both science and religion embrace the idea that our life energy is everlasting. Though the form of that experience of that energy might change, whether you believe in one life here on Earth reincarnation, or string theory, we will all experience that natural cycle of life and death. And I do. I, 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 be, I am a pagan. I believe in reincarnation. My grandmother, who I grew up with, was a Methodist. She believes she's in heaven. And, okay, maybe I... Well, no, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say, maybe I'm not a good pagan because I believe both. But you know what? Guess what? It's my faith. Don't have to prove it to anybody. I can believe that. For me, what gives me comfort, what, what makes sense to me is reincarnation. But when I think of my grandmother, I, I see it both ways. There are some days I'm like, I know she's in heaven looking out for me. She's good. She was a good woman. But then there's other times, and I have had one very odd experience where sometimes I feel that she's back. She had a hard life, and so I had always hoped for her a better life the next time around. And I, uh, I dated a woman for just a, yeah, a couple of years, and she was from Chicago. And we went up to Chicago. We got up there late one night, and we went to visit her sister, who had a little girl. And uh, I walked in the door. I'd never met them before. I'd never met the little girl. I walked in the do door, and that little girl came running up to me and just threw herself against my legs. I was like, OK, I like kids, but I'm more tend to be a little more standoffish. And so I'm like, but maybe it was the whole thing, like cats like people who don't like cats. I don't know. So, so I'm like, what? And the woman I was with, her sister kind of looked at me weird, like, what are you doing with my child? And she goes, she doesn't like people. She goes, I don't know what's going on. That little girl would follow me around the house. And she would come up, and she would just look at me. Just look at me in the face, just like, just looking at me. I'm like, okay, you're a little odd little girl. But then, then she would, like, if I was sitting down, she'd come and she'd lay her head in my lap and just, just be there. And it's, you know, I just got that feeling. I'm like, whoa, Grandma? <laughs> um, and, oh, I'm going to get teary. It worked for me because I knew... If this little girl was her energy returned, she was going to have a good life. Things were going to be a lot better for her this time. And one last experience. I have a, I have a friend that her, her best friend was dying of cancer. And they had their Christmas dinner, and I went with them. And we, we shook hands, you know. It was like, hi, Vicki, nice to meet you, stuff like that. That was all I talked to her. She died just a couple of months later because she didn't want to do anything to try to stop it. And I'm, you know, sleeping one night, and the next thing I know in my dream is here's Vicky, and it was very odd because it was in a hospital and a woman was giving birth, and as the baby came out, I cannot to this day I cannot tell you, I cannot explain the joy 
that I felt. I don't think I've ever felt that kind of joy in my life over anything. But the joy I felt emanating in that dream from that baby being born, and the, the thought that what I thought, heard, felt in that moment was, oh my God, I'm glad to be back. I was like, I woke up and I was, got a hold of my friend and I said, hey, I just had the weirdest dream about Vicky. And my friend burst into tears. She said she'd be back. Never had another dream about the woman again. Don't know anything more about her other than that. But it also gave me some peace. It was a little weird, but it gave me some peace. Maybe that did happen. Maybe that was her message back. And then my friend said, well, why doesn't my dad talk to me? He swore he'd tell me. He'd, he'd reach out to me afterwards. Maybe you're too close. But again, it's all what works for the people that are experiencing this. And we all walk different paths. Reincarnation, heaven, hell, Alicia, Valhalla, wherever, Nirvana, wherever you're going. Uh, just know that be comforted by what works for you. And understand that it may not work for other people. So we are all in this together, and we will be all be going out. Maybe not together, but in the same fashion. Okay? Have a good day. Give me a complex. Hi, Trisha Wagner. Um, one of the things that I think about um, when people are talking about an afterlife and, and you know, you're talking about what works for you, for me, the idea of eternity is frightening. Like, to have consciousness, con Consciousness forever would be very daunting. And so I think that for some people, the idea is a comfort. And for me personally, it's actually the opposite. And so I'm very, like, I feel the, okay, my body will, conti will continue on in some form. It'll disperse and those, you know, I will become part of the cosmos again and all of that kind of thing, but the idea of continuing to have some sort of connection to consciousness is actually quite daunting to me because forever seems like just too long a time. <laughs> <laughs> might, might be long. Yeah. I think, and, and maybe that's why we tend to, if, if there is reincarnation, why we don't remember the life before because maybe forever is too long. You know, and, and I find it fascinating in some of the stories that I was reading about reincarnation is that young children tend to, there are young children who tend to have memories that as they get a little bit older and get more involved in the world outside them, those memories tend to fade. Are they memories or are they kids just making stuff up? But I'm always fascinated by how kids can make up stuff they've never heard of before, you know, or had that experience. Hello, my name is Cheyenne. Um, I am also pagan, but I like take many different beliefs about the afterlife and about reincarnation and all this sort of thing. I kind of take them all and like blend them together, sort of. So I believe in something called the oneness. Um, it's this theory that every, not even just every person, but everything 
is not only conscious, but it's all part of one consciousness. And it's all one sort of mind branching out and experiencing every possible um, existence that it can in order to seek knowledge. Um, and in that way, we're all connected. But that sounds cool, too. I love hearing different things because it makes me think. Hi, I am Nancy, and uh, I, I've shared with the group on other occasions some of my weirdness. Um, I grew up. Uh, or in growing up, my dad worked, he was an engineer, so we moved a lot. He had different jobs and, and he kept moving around. He was part of the uh, up and coming um, science industry back in the 50s. And, and so we traveled across the United States so many different times and he'd always take a different route. But one time we were driving along and I wasn't uh, maybe eight, maybe something, something there. I always thought I was eight. No matter where we were, so I think I'm eight. But I'd have to look at his resume to know where I really lived at what time. But we were going through this one town, like we went through the many, many, many towns. And all of a sudden, I had this overwhelming feeling. I'm looking around, I, goes, I know this town. I know if you put me in this town, I would know the streets and where everything was and what these, everything about this town as I traveled through it. And I thought, that is weird. So I went back to reading my books. But years later, when I learned about what deja vu was, it immediately took me right back to that experience I had, because I knew I had been in this town. Didn't know why, but I knew it. Just yeah. knew yeah. that town. It's weird. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing. We don't know everything. So, and, and in anthro, that's, that's the big thing. One, you don't judge, but you also acknowledge that we don't know everything, and we're still learning, and what we may think is gospel now will be something to completely different down the line. Thank you. Janine Zilsby. Um, I, I just kept thinking about, and I don't know how many of you have been here long enough to remember the <coughs> visits that we have had from Matthew Dowd. He wrote the book, Thank God for Evolution. But... Yeah, they, they had been here, he and his wife, who's a scientist, and he's the ministerial part, but they're an interesting mix. Um, and if you read Thank God for Evolution, <laughs> because he does the same sort of thing, and he states that he can talk to the most fundamentalist group, or you use pagan... and. Everybody, and everybody understands him because of how he knows the language to use to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant book. Matthew Dowd, Thank God for Evolution. Cool. There is another book on my list. <clears throat> oh, no problem. Um, hi, I'm Lou Hoover. Um, I don't have any particular beliefs. I uh, live in uncertainty, and I just, you know, I think after I die, surprise me. Uh, um, but um, my father died when he was 47, and I was 19. And of course, losing him that young, I've had a lot of pain and still do because mm -hmm. of all the parts of my life he missed out on. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, I, I mostly have very good memories of him. Uh, when He was a self-taught musician, and he taught me how to play the ukulele <clears throat> when I was quite young. And uh, got quite a kick out of me singing that late Louis Bill Lou when I was six. <laughs> um, Oh, what that vampin baby might do. Um, anyway, so after someone dies, your relationship with them doesn't end. 
you keep working on things. And so even though it was mostly good, there was a period of time or, or when I was working through some anger with him and I was, had that ukulele hanging on the wall and I was walking past it and feeling angry at my dad and suddenly the little bridge that holds the bottom of the strings in place pulled loose with a bang just while I was walking past to the anchor, and I, mm -hmm. I've always wondered about that. Yeah. <laughs> I would wonder about that, too. <laughs> we have a guest violinist. Where are we going to ask him to play? Well, I did ask him if he would play, um, but he was he was concerned that we didn't he didn't have any music with him and okay. didn't have a piano accompaniment. Well, so, yeah. Ah, now your secret is out. But I have asked him if he would be so willing to return and uh, honor us with some of his music. And he said that he would. So we will, we will be hopefully having him back. OK. OK. We will, we will get the two of you guys together so that we can enjoy some beautiful music down the line. Yeah. 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 Hopefully, um, uh, maybe we'll get together and, and get all of you guys together and we'll have a, a wonderful service uh, with music. Excuse me? Oh, next week is music, so we will. Uh, that may be a little quick, but we will. We will definitely be talking with you more. And thank you again for coming today. Yeah, we we won't push too hard. Yeah. All right. Are there any other? comments or any other sharing that people would like to do. Come on up. Um, Mindy Backus. I lost my mom when I was 21 and um, she always took care of me. And you know, there are things that happened in my life. I had, um, when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and lost my job because of it when I was Oh gosh, 29 or something like that. Um, and there are all of these things that, had I been a Christian, I would have called miracles. And, and that's okay if you're a Christian, all these things to call miracles. And instead, I believe they were things which my mom did for me. You know, that she was able to impact me even though she was dead. And I don't think that's any stranger than saying that there's a God up above that's impacting those things. And I don't think it's any stranger to say my mom was doing this for me than it was to say, you know, a God was doing this for me. And since then, you know, there are things in my life where I feel like my mom, wherever she is, and I don't know in what form or what place, that she impacts my life and she makes things happen that shouldn't have happened in order for me to be okay. So I just, I think, you know, it would be wonderful if we could still have that kind of contact with our loved ones wherever we go or whatever form we're in once we've expired out of this, what we think is die. Um, I think it would be great if we could still have that contact with loved ones. So that's what I choose to believe is that mm -hmm. whatever form they're in, they can still reach out and help us. So cool. Very cool. Okay, anybody else? Hey, Jake, let's uh, do the cellist extinguishing and then we'll do the music, okay? All right, well, thank you guys for being here today. Um, we'll, I will do the... Uh
closing with the chalice. Um, For dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou return. The body returns from whence it came, as does the soul. Just as this flame came to life, so too it shall die. We are at one with the cycle of our existence. Blessed be. Thank you, guys.